Welcome, and thank you for joining us on this wondrous occasion. When William Rainey Harper and John D. Rockefeller established the University of Chicago, they embarked on a radical experiment. An experiment predicated on the belief that higher learning should be marked by research, not recitation, extension, not insularity. Central to this experiment was a commitment to lifelong learning, an effort to specifically reach, and I quote, those who lived beyond campus and did not fall into the established categories of students, end quote. This experiment soon became a model of the 20th century university as the forces of urbanization, globalization, and technology accelerated the adoption of the University of Chicago's novel approach. With this convocation, we mark 125 years since we first opened our doors to students. And we celebrate your achievements as the natural continuation of that experiment started over a century and a quarter ago. Your efforts, your dedication, and your commitment to advancing your knowledge and your capabilities embody this university's founding values. At the same time, the exact forces that drove the creation of the 20th century university are driving the evolution of higher education today. This, along with the ongoing redefinition of what it means to be a student and an alum, suggests that not only are we celebrating today with an eye towards the past, we are also celebrating with an eye towards the future. Your accomplishments reflect not only our core founding values, but both Graham's and the University of Chicago's commitment to be a model of the 21st century university. On behalf of the instructors and administration at the Graham School, as well as all those gathered here, family and friends, congratulations. It's our hope that you will consider the University of Chicago not as a moment of study, but rather as your intellectual destination, your academic home now and for many years to come. Congratulations. We will now present candidates for the degrees Master of Liberal Arts, Master of Science in Analytics, Master of Science in Threat and Response Management, and Master of Arts in Teaching. It is my honor to present this student who has completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the William B. and Catherine V. Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. He, has been, he or she has been awarded the degree Master of Liberal Arts by the Board of Trustees. Will the recipient of the degree Master of Liberal Arts please ride, rise and proceed to the stage to receive your degree. Renee Fennell. Michelle Varble. And now it's my honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the William B. and Catherine V. Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. They have been awarded the Master of Science in Analytics by the Board of Trustees. Will the recipients of the Master of Science in Analytics please rise and proceed to the stage to receive your degree.
Hassan Al Khatib. <laughs> Charles Blumenthal. Giancarlo Di Bonaventi. Sebastian Donadio. Tomas Salgado Garcia. Alexander Isaac Glick. <laughs> Ristina Lechevora Rostova. <laughs> Harun Janju. Tao Jang. Mamta Kakar. Cindy Cartman. Mincy Lai. <laughs> Wayne Luan. <laughs> Chaitanya Manthina. Apurva Mental Carlos Moya Pacific in Rwanda. Laura Christine Olson. Spotty Patel. Enrique Cavetto. Robert Sauter. <laughs> Nicole Catherine Urigashili. <laughs> Anthony Vijay.
David Warner. Josh Warren. Now, it's my honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the William B. and Catherine B. Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. They have been awarded the Master of Science degree in Medical Informatics by the Board of Trustees. Will the recipients of the Master of Science degree in Medical Informatics please rise and proceed to the stage to receive your degree. Miriam Ayana Bimbeck. <laughs> Melissa Jane Byrne. Samaprit Chakbrati. Christine Clark. Congratulations. Filza Iqbal. Steve Loke May. <laughs> Jeffrey David Oliver Smith. <laughs> Paul Jason. Pak V. Savage. <laughs> Aloki Patel. <laughs> Kevin D. Shap. Andrew Brian Schneider. Thomas Joseph Smith. Leslie Ann Sproul. Anuba Verdon. Abigail Watson.
And now it's my honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the William B. and Catherine V. Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. They have been awarded the Master of Science degree in Threat and Response Management by the Board of Trustees. Will the recipients of the degree of Master of Science in Threat and Response Management please rise and proceed to the stage to receive your degree. Rhonda Marie Anderson. <laughs> Dean Angelo Jr. Hi, Althea. Althea. Avis Barrio de Guzman. Alejandro Cabral. John Saletti. Got a bin. Chris Heck. <laughs> Lamicus Roman Lavender. Patricia Guadalupe Nieves. Kara <laughs> Noel Noverio. William Riga. <laughs> Noland Rivera. Anthony Michael Sabella. Andres Sanabria Araja. Ravi Shiv Singhvi. <laughs> Milan Civic. Jason Michael Smith. John Ventrella.
It is now my honor to present these students have, who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the William B. and Catherine V. Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. They have been awarded the degree of the Masters of Arts of Teaching by the Board of Trustees. Will the recipients of the degree of the Masters of Arts in Teaching please ride and proceed to the stage to receive your degree. Michaela Betts. America Cannon. Hannah Dax. Bridget Dacherty. Amaris Evans. Megan Fair. Aaron Ireland. Newer Jabri. <laughs> Leah Cook. <laughs> Catherine Lyons. Elizabeth Mabry. <laughs> Virginia Melanson. Lizette Mello Benitez. <laughs> Nathan Rochelle. Paige Richardson. <laughs> Haley Saras. Jamie Sloan. <laughs> Catherine Stevick. <laughs> 
Simon Toledano. Caleb Wagner. <laughs> Benjamin Wallen. Larnard Travis Young. Let's have one more round of applause for all wonderful graduates. <laughs> it is now my enormous pleasure to introduce our featured speaker. Emily Lynn Osborne. Emily is an associate professor in the Department of History in the college at the University of Chicago. She earned her BA in History from the University of California, Berkeley, and a PhD in History from Stanford University. She is a specialist in West African history and has carried out ethnographic and archival research in Guinea Conarque, Senegal, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, Sierra Leone, Ghana, and the Gambia. Her writings have been featured in leading academic publications and address a range of issues from the history of statecraft and gender in West Africa to processes of technology transfer and diffusion. Emily is currently a member of the faculty board of the Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. She also directs the University of Chicago Study Abroad Program in Dakar, Senegal, and serves as a faculty advisor to the Center for International Social Science Research, the Posen Center for Human Rights, and the Chicago Center for Teaching. Her faculty associations include the Committee on African Studies, the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality, and the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. In 2016, she was awarded the Quantrell Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching, which is one of the nation's oldest prizes for teaching and one of the highest honors a U Chicago faculty member can receive. And lastly, on a personal note, I can say as a fellow laboratory school parent, Emily is someone who's great cheer and guidance has been enormously valuable to me, both as a father, but also as a dean here, and I'm really grateful that she has accepted the opportunity to come and speak to us today. So, Emily. Thank you, Dean Nemec, for that introduction. It has been a pleasure these past few years to serve on the faculty board of the Graham School and to learn about all its degrees and activities as well as its partnership with UTEP. It's also a privilege to speak with you here today, as I hope my address will make clear. When Dean Nemec approached me about speaking at convocation today, I was very honored. I was also quite daunted. Indeed, I have learned that this is the sort of honor that can produce a pit of anxiety in the stomach, which is precisely what happened to me, at least until I decided how to go about crafting this address. I am a social historian by training. That is, I investigate how everyday people over time engage with and transform the world around them. And so I've decided to approach this address today as an exercise in social history. To that end, I have carried out conversations with students who are graduating today from UTEP and from Graham. I have talked with administrators, professors, and instructors with whom you have worked, and I have plumbed the university archives. This effort has revealed that this world-class university has a long and vibrant tradition of continuing education and teacher training. That tradition links you, who are graduating here today, to the very origins of the University of Chicago. 
In the late 1890s, President William Rainey Harper, who was the founding president and architect of the University of Chicago, thought it was imperative to bring the university's many advantages to people who were unable to attend classes on the main campus. He organized the university into divisions, one of which was devoted to giving classes downtown. It also offered classes to students living even farther afield via correspondence. Robert Maynard Hutchins, who served as president from 1921 to 50, 50, 1929 to 51, further fortified the outward orientation of the university. That is because he believed strongly in the ap broad applications of higher learning. As he put it, the purpose of the university is nothing less than to produce a moral, intellectual, and spiritual revolution throughout the world. Hutchins acted upon this belief by establishing himself as a very public figure. He lectured widely, spoke on the radio, and published his ideas in popular magazines. University College, which was the entity of the part of the university devoted to extension, launched a range of initiatives during his tenure. With Mortimer Adler, Hutchins himself taught great books courses, which were open to the general public. Some of those classes were taught in the lecture hall at the Chicago Art Institute. This focus on connecting with the public means that the University of Chicago's presence downtown, where many of you carried out your coursework, is nothing new. The Gleischer Center, which President Hannah Gray helped to bring about, is simply its latest manifestation. In the early 20th century, the University of Chicago's footprint could be found on 19 South LaSalle Street. And in the 1940s, University College operated out of 18 South Michigan Avenue. And while the university established itself from the outset as a bastion of humanistic learning, it also brought learning to life across a spectrum of topics, including some very practical ones. In the 1920s, for example, the University of Chicago built upon its location as a major Midwestern crossroads of commerce and manufacturing. It partnered, partnered with the Institute of Meatpacking to offer home study courses, you'll appreciate this, at a cost of five to ten dollars per course <laughs> on topics such as meatpacking science and production and marketing of livestock. The archives hold other lessons as well. While we may think that some of the fields of study represented here today are utterly novel and cutting edge, there are historical antecedents for each of them. Echoes of today's threatened response management program can be found in the 1940s, when the university ran a series entitled The Essentials of Civil Defense. Its syllabus focused on themes such as civil defense, civil defense communications and command, medical services and civil defense, and emergency social services. For those of you who are here today earning a master's of liberal arts, you are continuing this university's long focus on the life of the mind and on the notion that enduring insights can be wrought from analyzing texts from the Western canon and beyond. You would have found yourself at home in some of the courses taught by President Hutchins himself, such as one entitled Great Books of Antiquity. Precedents can even be found for today's quest to collect and interpret data, which lie at the heart of today's analytics and biomedical informatics programs. In the 1930s, the University of Chicago's downtown office became home to an institute of statistics. It offered classes that were meant to, quote, meet the needs of business, industry, technology, government, and science. Its students included insurance agents, stockbrokers, doctors, and civil servants. Back then, you could have enrolled in classes focused on cost accounting and advanced applications of business statistics. And for those UTEP graduates, in the late 19th and early 20th century, some of the university's most devoted students were ones who lived in rural areas, in places that were inaccessible to institutions of higher learning. Many of those students were teachers. They sought to advance their education and that of their students through correspondence courses offered by the University of Chicago. And correspondence courses really were the online learning system of the late 19th and 20th centuries. It is notable the geographic shift that we can see at play in this history. Whereas in decades past, it was rural areas that suffered isolation and disadvantage, today it is urban centers, neighborhoods and communities, many of which are not far from where we stand today, 
that are in need of resources and connections. While the scholarly fields of study represented in this room are diverse, I have found in my conversations with some of you powerful streams of commonality. You share a deep commitment to learning, an interest in identifying and surpassing new challenges, and an abiding dedication to the notion that ideas and principles matter. One of you told me a story about your pathway here that has, in particular, stayed with me. It testifies to the way that the Graham School can serve as a front door to this world-class university. This individual grew up here in Chicago in a household headed by a single mother. Wealth was not abundant. When in high school, he was not directed to college. To the contrary, some of the adults in his life told him, quite bluntly, that he would never amount to much at all. He dropped out of high school. Some years later, he is here today with us. He has earned a master's degree from the University of Chicago, a place where, as a youth, he never imagined himself. This trajectory is a reminder, if ever we needed one, that our opportunities do not present themselves equally to all people, and that some people have to work much harder and overcome much more to gain entry to and succeed at this university. That story is specific and particular to that individual, but there is a driving force behind it which is not unique, and that is the quality of striving. In the account of your presence here today, in the degrees that you have earned, there is a role played in each of you of striving and of seeking. And so I would now like to say a few more specific words about each program and their graduates. For those of you who have earned your Master of Science in Threat and Response Management, you're over here, correct? Many of you are military veterans. Many of you come from law enforcement, while others of you hail from other fields, such as ins the insurance industry and risk management. You have years and even decades of hands-on experience dealing with emergencies of all kinds. This program demands that you strike a balance as working professionals between your day jobs and your studies, between theory and know-how, between abstract model and practical application. You have learned from practitioners and consultants, from FEMA officials, from Argonne employees, and from the tight-knit cohort and camaraderie of your classmates. You are from disparate professions, but you are each compelled to mitigate disasters, be they of human or natural causes. I think I speak collectively for everyone in this room when I say we are grateful for your willingness to assist your fellow human beings in time of, times of crisis for your readiness to give back to society and to the communities in which you live and work, and for the expertise that you bring to this important enterprise. I also wish you many happy weekends ahead, free of your once-a-month intensive three-day sessions at the Glacier Center. I think your families will be glad to have you back. For those of you who are here today with the analytics program, some of you come from right here in Chicago, and others of you hail from countries across the world, including Bangladesh, China, India, and Pakistan. You are driven by an interest in how data, of which today there is an incredible amount, can be used to help make sense of the world around us. You seek to test the evidentiary basis for received knowledge and commonplace assumptions. You are able to use data to build intelligent machines and enhance decision making. Your analytic schools have been home to help us better predict, control, and optimize a range of outcomes, preferences, and behaviors. This rigorous program has required that you code and work in teams and tackle complex, difficult problems. Given the world in which we live, I do not think that there will be any shortage of either professional opportunities or data in your future. And to the Biomedical Informatics Program. You're here, yes? Here, here? Okay, thank you. For you, this is a particularly auspicious occasion, for this is the first class to graduate from this program. So this is the first time they're here. As 
with the other master's programs, the routes that brought you to this course of study are varied. Some of you are already clinicians working as medical prof professionals. You are doctors, a surgeon, fellows, and researchers. Others come to the program from other fields, including information technology and banking. You are guided in your studies by an acute sense of purpose, which may come from, that purpose may come from painful personal experience with a disease and its treatment, or from a research question, or from experiences on the front lines of patient care. And you are moved by the conviction that our healthcare system can be greatly enhanced if information about disease diagnosis and treatment could be better collected, shared, parsed, and synthesized. Ultimately, you seek to improve patient care. The work ahead of you will be shaped by many colliding forces, many of which you cannot control, from politicians and bureaucrats in Washington, to technological and medical innovations, to legal regulations, fiscal realities, and the shifting dynamics of the insurance industry. But the skills you now possess have the capacity to help make healthcare both more accessible and more effective, and those are worthy and critically important goals. For those in the Master of Liberal Arts, this program, of which we have two, right? And the two representatives. This program and your participation in it is proof of the enduring value of the liberal arts and of the profound insights that can be gained from engaging with texts, some of which were written across great gulfs of time and place. You range in age from 26 to 76. I think we're at the lower end in our representatives today. <laughs> Some of you are working and others retired. There are people in this program who come from different walks of life. They are teachers and homemakers, police officers, attorneys, business executives, and an architect. In the process of earning this degree, you have, may well have honed your writing, communication, and problem-solving abilities. But for many of you, those skills were not necessarily the motivating force for pursuing your degree. Many of you were drawn to this course of study because of nothing more and nothing less than pure, unabashed intellectual curiosity. The feeling is mutual. Your esteemed professors, several of whom with whom I have spoke, deeply appreciate your hunger for learning and the rich and varied perspectives that you bring to the process of intellectual inquiry. They find you singularly inspiring. And now, for the graduates of the Urban Teachers Education Program, UTEP. You're here, yeah? Okay. In the 1930s, the University of Chicago adopted the motto and became known as the Teacher of Teachers. Today, it is at UTEP that this slogan is most fully tested and realized. It strikes me from talking to you and to people who work closely with you that you are here for one core fundamental reason. You believe that all children, no matter where they live, no matter the color of their skin, no matter their first language, their financial means, or their immigration status, deserve a great education. It is well documented that UTEP enjoys a spectacular and unparalleled retention rate. 90% of UTEP teachers who work at Chicago Public Schools still hold their jobs five years after graduation. And I am counting on you to maintain that rate. <laughs> this is so in part because of the firm relationships that this program fosters, which link UTEP staff and faculty to UTEP graduates who are in the classroom and teaching our children. These networks provide vital support well after any diploma has been conferred and earned. In this era, when the promise of public education has come increasingly under assault from pressures political to fiscal, your focus on educating some of our most underprivileged children and neighbors here in the city of Chicago is truly a noble one. And I am counting on seeing in the future some of your students in my classes here at the University of Chicago. It occurs to me as I have spent time with some of you and pondered this turning point in your lives that we at this university may have occasion to see many of you again. You are, as one of you put to it when I talked with you, constant learners. 
And so it would not surprise me if someone from the Threat and Response Management Program returns to pursue a Master of Liberal Arts degree, or for someone from the Liberal Arts Masters to try his or her hand at analytics, or for a biomedical informatician to decide that while our medical system may demand help, so do, do, do our schools, and thus you may find yourself at UTEP. And for you UTEP graduates, well, I do not want to hamper that retention rate in any way. <laughs> But it is certainly possible that a UTEP teacher may wish to unlock and reconfigure the matrices that are used to measure school outcomes. It may be that you decide that you have a solution or a way to help your students and their families navigate the healthcare system, and so you pursue a degree in biomedical informatics. Or that you need to, in the face of a crisis, you realize that the cool and systematic training of a threat and response management program would be of use. Or you may follow in the footsteps of your late 19th century forebearers in the rural hinterlands of the United States and pursue courses in the liberal arts. I will just emphasize you can do all of that on a part-time basis. <laughs> to conclude, it is well known that the University of Chicago is a world-class university. But I have come to believe very strongly that it is students like you all of you here today who helped to make the University of Chicago of the world and in the world. So to the class of 2017, I thank you. Thank you for your dedication, your passion, your clear-eyed conviction, and your striving. And thank you for helping the University of Chicago to live up to the traditions and the commitments to be a university of the world and in the world that lay at its foundation. May our paths cross again, until then, congratulations and thank you. I would like to thank you, Emily, for a well-delivered and engaging keynote. Graduates, we would now like to take the opportunity to recognize and thank the friends and family who have joined in your celebration today and whose support of you has helped make this day possible. We now invite all graduates and guests to a reception located in the atrium, just outside of this auditorium. Guests, please remain in your seats until after the dean's party and graduates have left the hall. Thank you.